In an attempt to silence his critics, Lovelock set about building a computer model of a planet he called Daisy World. A model he hoped would prove Gaia's validity once and for all. I mean, uh, it was a model of a simple planet that's orbiting the, the, a star like the Sun. And uh, this particular star, like our own Sun, warms up as it grows older. And uh, the only life there is on, on Daisy World are daisies. One dark and one light. You won't get any germination until the, the surface is somewhere has warmed up to about four degrees Celsius. Then the first daisy seeds will germinate. The planet was quite cold. And what would happen at first was dark daisies would be favoured. It had been selected, naturally selected. Being dark, they'll absorb more heat than the, the, the surface, so they'll warm up first themselves and then their locality, so they'll start spreading. Quite rapidly, dark daisies grow and then spread and spread and spread, and the temperature zooms up, and so do they, in a strong positive feedback, until you reach a point where the planetary temperature is high enough for white daisies to grow. And then they start competing with the black daisies for space. And as the sun's heat gets warmer, so gradually the proportion of white increases. If it got too warm, then the white daisies, which tend to reflect radiation away, would cool the planet down. And the system would fall into a regulatory pattern. And the competition kept the temperature exactly at the optimum for daisy growth. And the whole thing's beautifully stable. The daisy world showed that evolution by natural selection is absolutely vital for Gaia. And there's no foresight. These things all happen by... From a Gaian point of view, uh, when we first started interfering with the atmosphere, nothing much happened. It was encompassing it by its ordinary regulating mechanisms. But when it gets too much, God can't cope with it. And this is why uh, I'm afraid, I think, it's going to play absolute mayhem with our civilization in the next 10 or 100 years. And when you see the whole picture, it, it, it is really fearsomely bad. I mean, things like the very rapid melting of the floating ice near the North Pole. As the floating ice melts, so less sunlight is reflected back to space by the dazzlingly white ice, and more and more sunlight is absorbed by the ocean. Just the melting of the floating ice in the Arctic Ocean will add as much heat to the Earth as all of the CO2 we put in the atmosphere to date. And this is why uh, I'm afraid, I think, there's very little we can do about it. All of our efforts to reduce emissions are as nothing. There is no morality about it. If the Earth improves as a result of our presence, then we will flourish. Uh, if, if it doesn't, uh, then we will die off. I fear that not many of us will survive, perhaps at best about a billion, possibly a lot less than that. Now, how they will die, it'll be by starvation, by war, by disease, who knows? The four horsemen really ride when conditions like that happen. I still think there's a lot to play for, but we will see the face of the world changed we're still in the midst of a kind of scientific revolution about how we, not only how we see or study the Earth, but how we see our relationship as humans with, with the Earth system or Gaia. The key lesson of Lovelock's life as a scientist is that he doesn't think in terms of any pre-existing consensus. 
but he's been able to radically shift the prevailing scientific paradigm to the point at which, from having been almost reviled, it's become part of the way scientists generally now think.